This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 36. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm here with Kyler Cheatham. Kyler, welcome to the show as always. Thank you. Happy to be here today. Yeah, thanks for being here. And uh, new episode uh, every Wednesday. You can find us uh, here on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube, or you can also find us on the usual podcast platforms like Apple, Google, Amazon, Spotify, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Be sure to find us there and subscribe to Transformation Ground Control. And this is episode 36. Like I mentioned, we've got a really cool episode, a lot of cool topics uh, as always. But then again, I I am a bit biased when it comes to this. These are topics that uh, Kyler, you and I think are really interesting and hopefully the audience does too. So to start, you've got, um, you've got some, you've been doing a really nice job keeping on top of some of the trends and some of the news and just general articles in the industry and the media about digital transformation. We're going to cover a few of those uh, in the opening segment here. Um, we're also going to talk about, uh, later in the show, we're going to have Wayne Holtham on the show, who is our vice president of our Australian office in at Third Stage, based out of Brisbane, Australia. He's the one that manages our teams and clients within the Asia-Pacific region. He's going to be on the show talking about process mining, which is an area that he specializes in. In addition to running that office, he also specializes in process mining, and it's super cool stuff. I it, actually learn a lot from talking to him about process mining. So I thought it'd be great to have him on the show to, to share some of his experience, not just explaining what process mining is, but how do you use it? What are some use cases behind it? So be sure to stay tuned for that. That'll be with Wayne Holtham later in the show. And then finally, last but not least, later in the show, the third major segment, we'll have uh, Teresa Richardson from the third stage team as well, who's going to talk about the ROI of change management. And uh, Sarah Dokovich, who uh, hosts our sister podcast called Digital Stratosphere. She had Teresa on that show recently, so we're going to play you a clip from that and have her on the show here to talk about the ROI of change management, what the real business value is, and sort of cutting through just the the touchy-feely part of change management and getting into the real the real business value behind it. So that's what to expect for the show today, but before we get to those uh, guests later in the show, uh, what are some of the things that you found in the last week as you're staying on top of trends and news in the digital transformation space? Yeah, absolutely. Well, my first piece of literature I wanted to cover today is called The Four Tiers of Digital Transformation. And and basically, it talks about kind of the evolution of digital technologies and leveraging them within your business. So the four tiers, I kind of want to take you through quickly um, the four tiers and some case studies around them. And then we can kind of unpack this newfound opportunity. Um, So tier one is called operational efficiencies. Um, So for example, here, Ford actually um, added a new vision-based inspection for its paint jobs on its vehicles. Um, It's virtual reality and connected to the Internet of Things, and it leverages AI. Um, And basically, it goes through and can can detect, excuse me, um, blemish, blemishes and, and then reduces defects in its cars. So making that quality um, more effective. Uh, the AI data prevents any sort of manufacturer defects in real time. So that's kind of the baseline tier one of operational efficiencies. Hmm. Tier two, they outline would be advanced operational assist- or efficiencies. So Caterpillar, um, that is a company that makes those big kind of construction vehicles they track how they use their products on each construction site. And for them, a lot of their data is based on their actual customers or B2B consumers that are using it for um, commercial building or residential building. Um, And they put trackers or sensors on their cars or on their vehicles so they can actually track a little bit better. Um, So 
unlike the previous example, why this is tier two is it, it benefits from those operational efficiencies by improving the product development productivity from the customer data, not just the internal data. Um, and I know we'll talk a lot about kind of internal data later today with Wayne. So that's kind of the, the second tier of gaining those efficiencies or those strategies from data you get leveraged by your customers. Hmm. Um, the third tier and where it gets pretty cool, Eric, is um, the value chains in data-driven services. So this, for example, um, GE tracks, just like Caterpillar and just like Ford, some of their jet engines utilizing that same AI functionality and data. Um, then because of the fuel savings, GE has come up with a new business model where they actually sell their products or their, their planes or engines um, and have outcome-based revenues. So if I save you this amount of money in fuel because of my very efficient engine, then the customer will actually pay them the difference. So giving them a new revenue stream. So this takes data from kind of creating efficiencies within the company to actually creating revenue. Um, and then our third, our fourth and final tier um, showcases the ability to actually kind of marry both ideas. And they focus on data-driven services from digital platforms. So for example, Peloton uses the product sensor data from its exercise equipment to create kind of a community of users. Um, and they match them using that AI with suitable trainers and then upsell them on the platform integrations or the different exclusive content and create a whole new value chain chain for their business in conjunction with their data. Um, so the reason I wanted to kind of spend a little bit more time on unpacking this is, is I was so interested in looking at digital transformations from this lens, because we talk a lot here about at third stage about efficiencies and looking at opportunities for our companies to um, get software or any sort of programs that might help benefit their business. Um, however, I have never really talked to you about creating actually a new line of revenue through data-driven strategies. So I, I wondered if you could kind of give me just some top-line feedback. Have you seen that? Have you, is that something that you've worked with clients on or something that you've noticed in the industry as well? Yeah, that's a really interesting topic because uh, it, it's top of mind for for me as well because coincidentally, and I, I didn't share this with you before we started recording the show, but later today I have a, a YouTube video shoot where I, I record my next batch of videos for my YouTube channel. And one of the topics I'm covering, uh, one of the four videos I'm going to record today is on Industry 4.0. So I've been doing a lot of research over the last couple of days about Industry 4.0, which it, it shares a lot of these same themes that you're, you're mm -hmm. talking about here, which is sort of that uh, data integration with customers and refining your business model and um, using it to help uh, identify quality issues and also to predictively um, to predictive maintenance to identify when maintenance might be needed on machines or uh, other equipment. So uh, it's a really interesting topic, and I think you know what you're getting at here with this article is that you know historically, you know up until the last few years, I'd say most of ERP and digital transformation types of projects were very much focused on efficiency. It's like how do we how do we tie together multiple systems? How do we have a single source of truth? How do we have a common interface? How do we uh, lower our cost structure and all that stuff, which is very valid. I mean, that's all good stuff. That's all fine. But what you're talking about is taking it to a whole nother level. You're, yes, you're doing that. That's sort of a bare minimum, I'd say, to be successful or to get the most value out of your transformation. But now if you really want to get value out of your transformation, here's what this is what you're talking about, which is, you know, how do you change your business model? And uh, how do you, you know, how do you use data to to better equip yourselves to make decisions and, to, um, you know, sell, cross sell additional services or to do the outcome based revenues that you were talking about. So to answer your question, yes, we're we're sort of starting to see this. Um, companies are finally starting to look beyond the, your traditional back office financial ERP system and now looking at technology as more of a a business model enabler. And a way to you know be closer to customers and to uh, generate new revenue models, all that stuff. I think where we saw the biggest shift in recent years toward that is during COVID. You saw a lot of organizations that, out of necessity and for survival purposes, had to figure out how to 
interact and integrate with their customers digitally, not because it's a good business model necessarily, which, which it is, or it can be, but in their case, they were doing it because they had to, to survive. So unintentionally, you know, sort of pushing a lot of organizations in that direction. So that's where we saw, have seen a lot of that adoption of, of technology in the last couple of years has been driven by the pandemic and just the economic and socioeconomic changes we're seeing in the world right now. That's forcing a lot of organizations, even B2B organizations that are selling to other businesses that you typically wouldn't think of as like as an e-commerce provider. You're seeing them right. act more like an Amazon or someone like that that can provide their services and goods online. You can do research, you can place the order, uh, ask questions, all that stuff, and and ultimately you'll be able to cross sell additional products and services and whatnot. So, um, so that's a long way of saying yes, we're starting to see it, but I'd say organizations in general are pretty slow to adopt this sort of technology. Although the what you're describing is very much a game changer, or can be a game changer for a lot of organizations. Right. So I wonder in that we talk a lot about future state and making sure that we have alignment on strategies. And I wonder if, say, an organization wanted to overcome that barrier into actually utilizing their data as a revenue generator. Is that kind of a piece that you would talk about in those main strategy sessions to make sure the technology matches that? Yeah, and it and it um, it's it's a good case to be made for why you should define your desired future state to some level of specificity prior to choosing technology. Because if you limit yourself to the technology you've chosen or that you may choose based on the current state, you're going to limit yourself and you're not necessarily going to be thinking of these these quantum leap improvements to your business model. So in some ways, not being shackled by any one type of technology and just thinking about what, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could do A, B, or C? And a lot of, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, a buzzword in the industry that's commonly used is the art of the possible, you know, so it's really thinking outside the box of defining, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could upsell, you know, customers digitally when they're placing an order based on their past uh, order history or based on what other customers like them are doing, leveraging data that we have in the system. You may not have the technology to do that today and, and uh, you know, your standard ERP system out there may not be able to do it either. But if you set that as sort of your future state vision, there's the good news is there's so much innovation in the technology space now. You can probably find tools and technologies that can help you help you get there. Yeah. Speaking of that, um, another interesting story that I came across today was just the Oracle Fusion capabilities and their new marketing automation um, and utilizing AI to engage with your customers. So Oracle has had a busy week this week, <laughs> you know, in, in the fact that we, we finally, in the last few weeks, have a ruling on, on their suit versus Google. Um, but first, I, I kind of want to dive into these technologies that now they're able to do um, for marketing automation and kind of talk about utilizing that data from your CRM or your contacts database to be able to have um, contact with your customers. So basically, um, this Reuters article talks about how, um, how Oracle has leveraged AI to automate parts of their digital marketing process. Um, and basically, Oracle Fusion will go in and take all of their systems, tie them together, and look at their user behavior with the help of some other third-party systems too. So you can really get a lot of measurable pieces that you haven't been able to do in the past. Um, and they talk about in recent years of just the growth of digital advertising and their, their goal here is to kind of bring that into one package by leveraging the software. So I know, Eric, you are a digital marketer um, in, in your own right in through third stage. So I wondered if you can um, kind of give us your feedback on actual software being able to take all of those different digital platforms, kind of wrap them into one, utilizing AI to engage with your customers. Is that, um, is that something that you feel like would be a huge value to as a business owner or a CEO of a company? Yeah, I, I think it can be. And, and the big caveat to that is assuming you've got the data and you're disciplined as an organization to maintain clean data that's going to fuel the proper level of AI and machine learning and all that stuff. Uh, which a lot of people forget, like AI and machine learning is really cool, but you need to have the right governance and data cleansing and migration in place to make sure that you, you have the, the data to support it. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, the 
the beauty of someone like Oracle doing that is because Oracle typically touches so many different parts of an organization through their cloud solutions and their applications and enter, enterprise performance management. You know, they touch a lot of data that you can be consolidated to help fuel some of these uh, cool technologies like AI and whatnot. So I think it's a, definitely a good direction. It's funny you say this too, because uh, you would almost think uh, this was all planned, which it really wasn't. Hopefully the audience believes this, but my one of the other uh, videos that I'm recording today is- a re It's like one month. You <laughs> know? But it's a review. I, I realized uh, a few weeks ago that I have never done a, uh, a video on what is Oracle Fusion. And so that is one of the videos I'm recording today as well. So you've already knocked out two of the four that the, and so this discussion is actually helping in that recording that I'll be doing here right after we're done with this podcast. Oh, good. Yeah, I think it's a great kind of um, bridge the gap between saying, hey, not only can I utilize my data as a potential revenue stream. So we kind of covered three, three things, right? We covered the efficiencies, operational efficiencies. We covered potentially actually making money or capital gains off of your data. And then we talked about the ability to not only create a communication structure through kind of predicting your user behavior through a software system. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's a great opportunity to, to talk about all of the different kind of artistic pieces, if you will, for software, um, which brings me kind of to my next article, which is about um, the Google Oracle dispute. And for any of our users that might not or need a refresher on that, basically through um, API and the way that Oracle API functions, they accused Google of leveraging their intellectual properties through using that Java API um, within some of their software and their modules. So um, long story short, they went through a, a big legal battle and the Supreme Court ruled that actually no API is more like a pedal in a car. So it's not the intellectual property so much. It's the baseline to build intellectual property on top of. So if you are in IP, very interesting argument here. Um, but basically what we find now is kind of a win for our open source products and some more artistic freedom, if you were for our software developers to leverage best practices in the industry and build upon them. So I know that this is kind of a polarizing issue. Some people say, no, that, that is intellectual property. Some people say, no, that is, you know, kind of just a, a baseline industry best practice. So I wondered if you had an opinion on this or you kind of gave us an, an insider insight to um, what this might mean for software development in the future. Yeah. Um... Well, I wish I could say that you just identified a third video that I'm going to record today, but that, that was not the case here in this <laughs> with this topic because I wasn't aware of it. But uh, what I find interesting, though, as you were talking about this, is how often Google seems to find themselves in legal disputes uh, recently, either ones they initiate or ones initiated against them. Because I just recently posted a couple weeks ago on social media about um, Google and Sonos, you know, have the lawsuit between the two of them. Sonos was suing Google over, you know, some of the technology that they allege were... Uh, being infringed upon. So I, I suppose in a, in a highly innovative industry like this, you're, you're going to get that. But um, I don't know, I, I guess I've honestly, I've never thought about that as far as it's almost like a, an argument for platforms being more of an open thing versus uh, even though you're talking about APIs, you're not necessarily talking about platforms, but it just reminds me of the whole concept of these companies that create more platforms for you to bolt onto or to participate in. I guess, you know, I guess I have mixed feelings on it. On one hand, that makes sense that, yeah, it's, an, it's a tool, it's a, it's a gas pedal, so to speak, within the digital transformation space. But if it's a really cool, easy to use gas pedal that gets you better gas mileage than if you used a different gas pedal, it seems like there would still be some intellectual property um, protection there. But I suppose that's why I'm not an attorney and have no desire to ever become one because I, I don't have those answers. Yeah. But it, it sound, I have mixed feelings on it, to be honest. Yeah, definitely. Well, if you are an IP lawyer and you have some opinions on this, definitely let us know. Yeah, we'll have to get an attorney on here to, to comment on that. Uh, but it, it's super interesting, though. So I would assume being able to leverage those proven strategies or best practices in the industry would be a, a win for someone like Odoo that is more of an open source system 
um, that can maybe take something that is a proven success and, and move it into more of a modular based system? Is that something that, that you've seen kind of happen with the open source community? Well, actually, it's, it's funny you asked that question because I was actually, as we're talking this through, two, two companies came to mind. One is um, Odoo and the other one was Salesforce because they both sort of have this platform concept with their with their solutions. They're, yes, there's software behind it, obviously, but there's also more of just an, a platform that's meant to be open to third-party developers in the case of uh, Salesforce and in the case of Odoo, you know, it's, it's even more open in terms of that, in, in the sense that customers themselves can change the code and sort of adapt the technology however they need to. So I guess the question is, is that really a win for Odoo and, or companies like Odoo and Salesforce, or does that put them at risk for a judge to say that they're a platform and therefore they don't have any, you know, the typical IP protection? I, I don't know. It, it seems I could go either way on that, but I, I could see, I could, if that's true, you know, if what we're saying is, is held up in court and it's a precedent or whatever, um, makes me wonder what does that mean for the open platform types of companies out there? Yeah. Yeah. That is a, a really a, a good point. Um, I think if we have anyone in the audience that is in the IP world, we'd love to talk to you. So definitely comment on this. Um, Eric does live streams every week. So potentially that could be a great conversation for one of those. Yeah, it's a great idea. Having someone that knows IP that could, could answer that would be a great help in, uh, you know, hopefully, if anything, it's given us a couple different viewpoints to, to view this from and something to think about as the technology industry continues to evolve like this. So, which brings me to my last article of the day, which talks about um, the continued evolution of our supply chain bottleneck and challenge. So this is actually by NPR, and it it's a great article, really interesting. Um, it kind of shows the landscape of an American manufacturer that can't get certain parts. So they have... They uh, compared it to having the 99 pieces of the puzzle, but just missing one, which completely stops their production. And I know we've seen kind of in our global news when it comes to the supply chain, just the overall bottleneck um, of not being able to get parts to actual manufacturers. For example, our um, LA port, which is huge here in the U.S., um, was how we get most of our our goods from our um, Asian counterparts over in China or Taiwan or Japan. And there is a two week bottleneck for ships to get unloaded. So it seems as though the article I was hoping was gonna give us like some great nugget of this will be over in two to three months, but it seems as though there is really no bigger outcome to be able to kind of solve problem. So I wondered if if you had any any silver bullet for us on on how we get out of that or or kind of work around that our manufacturing audience can kind of consider um, to be able to still produce their products. Yeah, I think this is a fascinating topic uh, to me. I know we've we've touched on it in other episodes as well, and um, you know we've done podcast interviews and separate YouTube videos just on this one topic. And it, it's something that I think is going to be a real issue or challenge for the next few years, uh, at least. But, you know, I'd say that, you know, what, what you're describing is very true. You know, you, we have tons of clients that have the same problem that, you know, you're missing one piece out of a hundred or a thousand or whatever it is, and you can't finish production because of that. You can't finish an order. In fact, I was reading uh, not too long ago, about uh, car companies throughout the world that are just sitting on inventory that's incomplete. It, it's missing the chips, you know, like we've talked about on the show before. It's missing the chips or the sensors for, you know, um, cameras or rear view, um, you know, the detect, detecting where the, where uh, when you're outside your lane or whatever the case may be. Um, so a lot of that, uh, they're sitting on a lot of this inventory. In some cases, they're trying to sell the inventory with as is without the missing components, which is always scary to think about, especially when it comes to a car. But that's where what a lot of organizations are having to revert to, unfortunately. Um, and there's, I think there's a certain amount in the industry, a certain amount of uh, mitigation that could happen in the form of redundancy in your supply chain. So in other words, not being overly dependent for any one raw material on any one vendor and knowing that you've got backup plans. If one vendor uh, fails or if one vendor jacks up their prices on you overnight, you've got another vendor you can fall back on. I think a lot of companies were caught pretty flat-footed because they've had these reliable 
parts of their supply chain that are not so reliable anymore. And in some cases, you can't, you know, there, in some cases, you might be relying on a component that only one person in the world makes or one organization in the world makes. But I think for most organizations, most of these shortages are things that you could get from other vendors. You just didn't plan ahead. So now you're scrambling and you've got stuff on back order, trying to get that last piece of the puzzle together so that you can ship to your to your customers. So I think it's sort of the million dollar question that companies have to fix within their supply chains. And there's technology out there, which is the good news. There's technology that helps you identify where those risks are. And it also helps you diversify and uh, give your uh, supply chain more flexibility too. So I think just thinking through that and recognizing that, you know, we might have to invest some time and money in this, but it's going to, we're going to recoup that time and money via, you know, increased revenue and uh, um, lost orders that go away or that you don't have to worry about as much anymore because you actually are able to fill demand. Uh, I think that's what you have to look at is build a really strong business case for, you know, investing in your supply chain and make sure you get that stuff right. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. Something that this article also covered is just the lack of ability to get um, people what they need through through natural disasters. Um, so, for example, a lot of the companies that were profiled, they make things like stump grinders or barricades or things like that, that they weren't able to respond to a lot of the hurricanes globally or some of the tropical storms as well. Um, so just talking about going through that process. So hopefully, you know, we do have some innovation um, built from kind of a silver lining of a, a really challenging situation. Um, but I think that's a good segue into our conversation with Wayne today or your conversation with Wayne, just talking about what are the controllables of a business to look at their own internal efficiencies and what's the best way to do that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, that, that gets into the whole uh, process mining discussion, which is meant to measure your actual uh, performance and actual performance effectiveness and efficiency uh, throughout the organization and throughout all your business processes and systems. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about uh, next. So why don't we take a quick break? And when we come back, we'll bring Wayne onto the show and we'll talk about process mining. Uh, that'll be with Wayne Holtham of Third Stage Consulting. But we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Okay, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, your source for all things digital transformation, and you can find new episodes of our show every Wednesday on YouTube, on Apple, Google, Amazon, Spotify, and all the usual podcast platforms. So be sure to check us out, subscribe to the channel, share it with uh, your colleagues and anyone else on your team that might be interested in this content. So uh, I'm excited for our next guest who is a repeat guest. He's been on the show a few times now, and he is Wayne Holtham from Third Stage Australia, which uh, is based out of Brisbane, Australia. And they handle all of our clients and team members in Asia Pacific. And... Um, Wanted to have Wayne on the show, not only because he's always a, a good guest to have, but because he has a number of different areas that he specializes in as a consultant, in addition to being a leader within the company. But his area, one of his areas of specialty is process mining. And in fact, he has sort of led the charge for some of our process mining related engagements throughout the world, uh, not just in Asia Pacific, by the way, but in other parts of the world uh, that we do business. And uh, so I thought, what a great topic to have him on to talk about, just to explain what process mining is. It's sort of an emerging technology with a huge amount of potential that I think a lot of organizations maybe know the term, but don't fully understand how it works or how it might relate to their digital transformation, or even those that aren't thinking about a big, massive digital transformation. There's a lot of value you can get out of just doing some process mining. So that all being said, uh, welcome to the show, Wayne. 
No, it's my pleasure. It's great, great to be back. Absolutely. Yep. You've been on the show here a few times, and you're always you always have interesting uh, case studies and real life examples to talk through here. Um, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself before we before we jump in? Um, I've been around the I suppose digital transformation space for probably last or, or as you can see 20, 30 years sort of thing. <laughs> Uh, it's about change and about getting people to be able to adopt process and to do things um, as, as, in a consistent way. So um, so that's important to me and it's one of the, probably the areas I find a real lot of benefit. Yeah, absolutely. So, and that's the topic at hand today is, is business process mining. Maybe just to start then, um, help us understand what exactly what exactly is business process mining. Uh, it's it's probably the 21st century's way to understand how well we do process. So many times we'll ask people and people will go, we do it this way. And uh, we assume that they're right. But we don't ask everybody. And so the value of process mining allows us to be able to sort of look into what actually happens and how many different ways it happens. And so um, that that's the difficult different paradigm, I suppose. So you're able to be able to um, look deeply into process and then work out what you need to do to get consistency or improve. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe let's build on that a little bit. Is it, um, is it a, is, is business process mining a framework? Is it a tool? Is it a manual process where you, you analyze different processes that maybe help us understand just at, at the most fundamental level, what exactly is it or how do, how do you how do you go about that at, at a high level well there's there's tools there that allow you to tap into the data and have a look at it i suppose third stage is um proposed and perfected a framework that allows you to be able to take that information that intelligence you have and then work through what do we have how do we solve it what does good look like how do we measure it okay and so um what what about um, when we think about business process improvement? You know that's that's a discipline that's been around for a long time, and you've had disciplines like uh, Lean Six Sigma that have focused on measuring processes and continuous improvement and can you continuously optimizing business processes and operations. How how is business process mining different from those other sort of business process methodologies like process improvement, process management, Six Sigma, that sort of stuff? Well, previously, you never had the ability to see what was actually happening. It's like the crystal ball. So you always worked on processes based on how people told you they were doing it. Whereas today, you can actually say, here is actually how you're doing it. And I can see how many other gaps are in our processes. Yeah. And the one thing that's important is it's not only how the process is done, it's the things that stop the process from being done. So many times we find we build workarounds and do those sort of things, and that leads to that process creep or inconsistency. Whereas this allows you to point those out and you can actually rectify those. So it could be master data, it could be um, just different workflows. It's, it's a number of different areas, yeah. Okay. And is it typically something that you would do um, within a certain functional area or department or a certain system, or is it meant to be more of an end-to-end -end, uh, business process flow or analysis of what's actually happening with your end-to-end -end processes, or, or is it mixable? It, it's, it's largely end-to-end, -end, and I think that's the real value to it. Many organizations get caught into the silo-based processes or business unit style process, whereas if you actually look at it end-to-end, that's where you get the value drivers and you can measure performance. And uh, that's where value comes uh, for the business when you're actually um, improving and get, getting, getting consistency. Yeah. Okay. And does that also apply, does that end-to-end -end mindset with process mining, does that also apply to multiple systems? So if I have multiple ERP systems or I have a, a financial and accounting system and a separate CRM and separate manufacturing can I do process mining across systems or do I, do I need to, am I limited by what systems I might already have in place? No, the tools today are actually very advanced. So you can have um, a whole landscape uh, of tools. It could be a CRM, could be a HCM of best of breed. And you can actually pick the process and then also identify 
where they interact with each of those um, platforms. So, uh, so really, really deep into the end to end process piece, no matter what technology you've bolted together or got architecture that supports that. Okay. So it can really cut across any system or systems that are touching the process. You would be able to sort of capture and analyze what's actually happening. With yeah, exactly those. right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so what, I guess if you, if you do this uh, process mining process, maybe, maybe help us understand, let's, let's just say I'm, I'm just starting the process mining um, process, not to be redundant with that word process. I feel like I'm going to keep doing that <laughs> through this discussion. Um, but the, when we're going through that process, I'm just getting started on it uh, for my organization and end process. What do I do? Like, what does it look like in terms of, uh, you know, how do I use the software or how does it, how does it collect data? To, to help me see the visibility into what's actually happening with my processes? Well, the software has a number of pre-built connectors. And so those connectors will um, tap into the database and pick up the, uh, I suppose, the tables in the background that house the transactional data. And so you extract that, and then the process mining tool does the evaluation. And, uh, and that's where you start to get the depth of knowledge that you're looking for, yeah. And many times you start with one process. Um, the best is probably a value driver process. So one that, you know, if it's not done well, it's costing money, costing time, those sorts of things. And so that's probably where the best part is to start out. Then you start seeing the value and you can actually, by carrying out those improvements, you're actually paying yourself back for the cost of actually doing the work. Yeah. Yeah just in the, the amount of inefficiency and broken processes you've identified using those, to, those tools? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So if I'm an end user, I'm on the front line and I'm, a, I'm actually the one, one of the people executing these business processes that we're, we're mining. Um, do I know that that process mining is, a tool is there or am I just sort of business as usual and in the background, it's, it's sort of capturing how data is flowing to me onto the next person and onto on the next person after that? It's in the background. You don't even see it's it's happening. Um, it does allow you if you take the advanced process mining, where it can actually advise you as a user, if you're not doing the process right, it will give you the ways that the process should be done, or it will provide you options to be able to um, you know follow up on things that you need to do. So if your accounts payable, accounts receivable and um, you've got some of these overdue or um, those sorts of things, you can actually get a, a warning and alert and say, you need to follow this up and this person's overdue or, or there's a bonus about to be paid. So you need to you know, um, process that vendor as it is sort of thing. So um, it's, it's quite powerful in the advanced part, but we're talking early about the evaluation piece. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. So what, when I use this process mining tool or a process mining tool to analyze my end-to-end processes, um, it's in the background, people are executing their processes as they would day to day. It's capturing data behind the scenes and the tables to, to help us analyze and understand where the, uh, you know, what the speed or velocity of process flow is and where the bottlenecks are, where the breakdowns are. Um, what, what sort of dashboard or end result do I get out of this, the system, out of the process mining tool? to be able to see what's happening? I mean, what does it look like? Or how would you explain that to someone who's never seen sort of what that would look like on the, the business process mining tool itself? Well, you start off with the linear process, end-to-end -end process. So if you took a procurement, you'd have a purchase rec, purchase order, you know, you receive an invoice, uh, goods receipt, and you'd, you'd see the linear process. And when you actually start evaluating, you start to see where the differences are. So you might get to the point where um, you've, you're starting a process down an invoice receipt. And so that's a that's a, a warning sign as such because you're actually purchasing without a purchase order. Mm. You don't know what your spend's going to be, you know, and it's maverick buying as such. And so that allows people to be able to go, well, why is our process not right? You might find the other area is where we're changing prices. So we've got a purchase order, we may have an agreed price and we send it to the vendor and they come back and say the price needs to change. And that could be a master data issue or it could be a vendor is not following the price catalog that they have. 
So you can see you've fixed lots of different areas as against just the standard process. Yeah. Mm. So it's sort of back to that question about how it ties into business process improvement methodologies. So it gives you the the analytics or, or the data or the knowledge or insights to be able to see that there's a problem there in that process where, um, you know, with that purchasing process you described or the PO process you described, and therefore I can now go to some root cause analysis to figure out why, you know, why are people doing it that way? Is that a training issue? Is it a system issue or whatever? Exactly right. And it allows you to drill down to every variant that you have uh, across that whole end-to-end -end process. So um, there could be 100, 200 different variants of the ways people follow through that process. Okay, interesting. So a company with like 10,000 employees, let's just say, you could have theoretically 10,000 or maybe even more different processes or different ways that people are doing different jobs within the same, within the same functions. Oh, exactly right. And the other benefit is that if you've got different divisions, you can actually benchmark against the divisions. And so you can see where the high performers are and mm. the ones that are actually following a process and others that are having issues or inconsistency in their process. And so you can start to improve against each other. Mm, it's really it's powerful. Is the reporting an analytical uh, tool set as far as just slicing and dicing what you see or what you're analyzing from the process mining tools? Is it pretty powerful or does it require a fair amount of human intervention and analysis to really make sense of all the data you're getting no, out of the process mining tool? No, it's very powerful. And you get, you get a no, number of different views. So you can see how close the automated process you could be. Um, you've, you can still see down to which vendor, which user, uh, which um, which actually invoice right down to the bottom level to be able to see where there's gaps or inconsistencies. Yeah. Very interesting. All right, good stuff. Thanks, Wayne. We're going to come back with more questions about process mining as soon as we take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. I know on the day I was born. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling, and I'm here with Wayne Holtham, and we're talking about uh, process mining. So let's jump back into the conversation. And then... Do you have um, maybe a, one or two examples of case, like a case study of where you've seen this process mining uh, tool used and sort of what, you know, what you measured, what came out of it, what you found, you know, what you discovered as a result? Do you, do you, could you share an example of that with us? Yeah, there's this one that um, recently uh, us were involved in, and that was um, following up after an S4 ha deployment had failed. And so um, they were looking at a number of different instances or uh, facilities that they had. And uh, they were trying to identify why they couldn't get consistent process. So they put in the process mining tool, looked at each of the instances and realized that all 17 instances were actually doing the process a different way. Even though S4 had a centralized single process that they had rolled out. And so from there, you could actually look back and improve the process that they're actually uh, using and start to align users to, to the process. And I think that's the key thing was that users could actually see the value of doing the process in a consistent way. And so um, that, that's the real benefit that this particular case study came with. Um, and following on now, they've actually built some business rules into the process mining and that allows them to be able to maintain consistency across all 17 of those instances. So um, mm. 
So that's that's the probably the flow on effect, and you can continually then measure how well your performance is going across all of your processes. So um, it's not a sort of just a let's look at it at the beginning. It's something that you can use and monitor all the way through. Really interesting. So it it's not necessarily just as part of a of an initial implementation, right? You said in this case, it was a, it was a S4 HANA failure and they had 17 instances, lots of different ways of doing things, but could you also just use it if I've already got, I'm happy, fairly happy with my systems, or I'm not really thinking about necessarily replacing all my systems, but I just want to get more out of them. Can I use it in that context too, or is it meant for more of a new system deployment deployment? No, definitely. And I think that with the pressure of people going, let's go to a new system, one of the first steps they should look at is how well do we do our processes with our old system? Because when I move to the new system, I want to have pretty consistent process. So I, what I build in the technology platform is closer to what we want is a smooth, simplified process. Whereas if we don't do that at the beginning, then the change effort is big, adoption is harder, and um, you know it just makes it much harder to actually roll out a total deployment program. Right, yeah, it makes makes total sense. Um, and I, I just wanna acknowledge there are a lot of questions coming in on LinkedIn. I just saw someone commented, I think Eric's ignoring us. So I just want you to know if you're on LinkedIn, <laughs> we'll get to your questions in just a moment. Um, and there's there's actually a ton of them there. Um, but let me get some of the basic questions out of the way here and then we'll, we'll dive into the, the real questions that the, that the audience has here. Um, so, um, you talked a little bit about the benefits of process mining. Maybe we'll just come back to that real quickly. You said that, you know, usually you can justify any sort of time and cost investment in process mining via the improvements and the, um, the potential improvements you can make as a result. Is that a fair summary? It is um, because many times the things that you uncover are very costly in loss of value in your organization. And so just by rectifying those and knowing where you actually, the problem is, so you focus right in on it, it's not a very costly exercise to actually overcome those, but the return is quite quite high. Right, yeah. And what's super interesting too is as you're describing this whole uh, process mining tool and the approach and the, the methodology and even in the case study you described, it's, it's a fascinating way to augment that traditional way of you know getting in a conference room and sort of mapping out our processes end to end. And, and really giving you some quantitative real data that's objective. It's not it's not infused with my opinion or internal politics or the fear of offending someone or just a you know misunderstanding of what's actually happening in reality. It's 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 very fact and data based, it sounds like compared to It is to and it's it's funny that you say that because we're working with a client at the moment and uh, we're mapping out all of the workshops that we're actually gonna use in the evaluation process. And they're saying but they're very short workshops. There's no day workshops uh, and we've got everybody involved and we're putting post-it notes on the wall. It's, it's very factual in what you're doing. And it's like an evolution process to get people understanding what's happening and then what should we do about it? Because the thinking is different then. And so the change process is different because you're working with real life as against assumption or people's opinion or all those sorts of things. So it's, um, yeah. it's, it's a whole different framework of getting the improvement. Yeah. Just think of all the times that you, myself, anyone else on the third stage team or any consultant out there has been in a conference room and just talking about processes and you get these perceptions like, oh yeah, we have a very common process for this or that, or, or they say, oh yeah, that's a broken process or we've got we don't have a consistent way of doing things that's still very subjective and qualitative but if you had actual data to back that or refute it you can say well actually here's what's really happening and this isn't again it's not an opinion it's fact of what's actually happening so it, i imagine it's very eye-opening to a lot of organizations that and see it is and and it stops that you know that whole thing of the we don't agree with that or that's not right here it is <laughs> it's quite clear yeah we could maybe disagree or analyze what the cause is you know why is it showing that but but it's hard to refute the data that actually comes out of that because because it, yeah. it is reality and so and some people find it refreshing because they've been stuck with processes that can't work properly because maybe master data isn't right or no one set up the vendor prior or, or you know there's a whole range of things 
that cause the issues. And they've had to work with that before and be forced to actually have a simple process. But those workarounds have, have been what they need to actually even get the process out, get it working. So, Right. Very interesting. Um, and then uh, maybe I'll ask this one uh, one more question I've got, and then I'm going to shift gears. If we've got questions coming in from multiple places here. I'm getting, We're getting bombarded, and I don't want people to abandon the uh, live stream because I'm not getting to their questions. But uh, <laughs> one last thing I'll ask just from my perspective is when you think about um, – process mining and organizational change management and, and bear with me because I, I know you know and the audience may not though but I cannot for the life of me get through a discussion without somehow tracing it back to change management so I'm going to do it again here um, how does it, how does process mining uh, or how does process mining potentially help from a change management perspective and if so how well if people can understand the why and I often see this in change management is the resistance is because people don't understand why they're doing or what they need to do. And so if you understand the why, the change effort becomes uh, more of a, we are happy to make this change. And so it's almost like a, um, I call it a push, uh, you know, a, we're pushing to get these process improvements. Whereas you as the change person aren't pushing them, they're pulling you along. So um, it, that's the difference with the change piece. And you can see um, small pieces of, uh, change improvement, which ends up to be big change overall. So um, you can quantify your change value. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it creates a, a clear story and a clear burning platform for change. You know, you can point specifically to real issues and real problems that, that are being addressed as a result of the. Of That's whatever. right. And, and not normally where we're looking at everything, you know, change program and digital transformation is quite large. You can actually pull bits off, rectify that, and you get incremental benefit as you go. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's more manageable. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, great. Well, let me let me shift gears here and uh, get to some of the the audience questions, and I've I've got some more we'll get to as well um, later on. But uh, first of all, we've got a, a very diverse audience here today. We've got people from uh, just a few examples: San Francisco, Ukraine, Pakistan, India, uh, Norway. South Africa, um, Venezuela, so a lot of different places. Spain, someone on Crowdcast uh, is on Spain. One of our frequent uh, attendees is, is from there. In fact, his comment is, an old Spanish dog is back to learn new tricks. So uh, I, I hope we're teaching him some new tricks here uh, in this discussion. Um, so first question from uh, Rahendra on uh, LinkedIn asked the question of, could you name some of the process mining tools that are out there? Just some examples of some of the, the leading tools. There's uh, two. One is called Solonis, which is probably the leading tool. And the second one is one that was recently purchased by SAP, and that's called Signavio. Um, and both of them are fundamentally similar. Uh, Solonis is probably the leader in the market and probably has the biggest market share. Yeah. Okay. Now, just as a follow-up question to that one, uh, to Rahanja's question, it, are these tools, you, you mentioned SAP has acquired Signavio. If I'm using Signavio or any other process mining tool, whether it's Solonis or anything else, um, it, is it technology agnostic? Can I use it with any other tool? Or if, I, if I'm if i using Signavio, is that only going to work with SAP because SAP owns it? No, it's, uh, they are technology agnostic. Um, SAP bought it because of, I think, many of the challenges of S4 and realizing there's lots of process change. And so they're probably trying to uh, leverage that as part of their um, rollout program or, or a future state for S4 deployments. Right. And just to add to the Salonis comment, that that's a tool that we use and you, you've helped us sort of forge that relationship and that use of that tool in our consulting methodology at third stage consulting, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. We're working with clients now. So, um, and getting some really great results. Yeah. yeah, that's very cool. I, I'll be honest, I didn't know what process mining was until I'm, you know, started talking to you about it um, probably a year ago or whatever it was. So it's- And there's two, there's two parts that I guess is the fact there's the tool, but it's also what you do with that tool. And many, mm -hmm. and in the early days, organizations would get it. The IT people would maybe plug it in. And because you didn't have that end-to-end -end view, it didn't really go anywhere. And so applying a framework where you actually have end-to-end -end view focus and the improvement and change piece in there 
that's where your value comes from. Right, right. Okay. Um, I'll try to take a stab at uh, this question here. This is from Hostiantin. I'm, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing it. It's on uh, LinkedIn. Um, and the question is, I guess process mining allows one to understand how processes are reflected in the systems so you can't mine off line processes. Is that true? Or do, does that question make sense to you? I'm not sure that I, I, I personally don't understand that question. Maybe you do. I, I think he's probably talking about uh, organizations that work a lot off system. And so people say, well, how can you process mine if that's the case? But what you pick up is you always have to have a record system of record. And so when you're going in and out of the system, you start to see the uh, time delays um, and, and you can piece together where the problems are. Um, many times people will snap it out of the spreadsheet and then uh, you know, do some process analyses and then put a number back in the ERP. And the problem with that is, is that number real or are we letting the ERP do what it's meant to do? You know, it's it's meant to be a finance tool. It's meant to be a, you know, a, a asset management tool. It's meant to be something uh, that allows those processes and financial records to be kept as a source of truth. And when we don't do that, the value of ERP is diminished. And so um, you can pick that up quite quickly. Interesting. So it's so maybe to paraphrase or make sure we're addressing the. the the question or the point here. So if I'm a if I'm an end user and you, we've got a process mining tool running in the background, I'm in SAP or Oracle or whatever my ERP system is. I pull some data out of it. I go to my spreadsheet. I do whatever I'm going to do, and then I come back and enter some data as a result of my analysis or manipulation in a spreadsheet. The process mining tool isn't going to know what I did in the spreadsheet outside the system, but it's going to see that there was a lag there, and then I would yes. know to drill into that so I could drill in and say, okay, why is there such a gap here? And then I would analyze that, get to the root cause and find that, oh, it's because people are going and doing stuff in spreadsheets or manipulating the data or going to other third party sources to get the data they need. Is that sort of that's what exactly you're yeah, that's what you find. Yeah. yeah, that's that's fascinating. All right, good stuff. Thanks, Wayne. We're gonna come back with more questions about process mining as soon as we take a quick break. We'll be back with more transformation ground control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Back to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling, and I'm here with Wayne Holton, and we're talking about uh, process mining. So let's jump back into the conversation. Another question. This is a question from uh, Robert uh, Speller on LinkedIn. He says, does this work like a GUI between apps? Interesting. Um, between modules, uh, it, it works. Yeah, so you can actually pick up the tables in the background that might be a finance uh, you might have some asset management, you might have those sort of things. So you can actually link those tables together to drive your end to end process. So it sits across apps and it works off the application layer. Okay, great. Um, there's a really good question here from Rahendra again on LinkedIn. I'm gonna come back to that in a second because it's a, it's a pretty meaty question and there, there's someone that's waiting or that asked a question a while back here on Crowdcast. Um, and this question is from uh, Karen on Crowdcast, and she says, how can users be doing something 17 different ways in a newly installed S4 HANA system? Which actually I was wondering that same thing. Um, <laughs> can you give some examples of, you know, how that's possible? Well, it's, it's um, you know, how they source their materials. It might be the uh, way they 
uh, have their materials catalogued. It could be the um, types of vendors they buy for. And so if you think that's a centralized purchasing solution they put in place, and if they're buying from all of the vendors outside the centralized system, where there's better pricing, there's contract agreements, there's those sorts of things, that's where the variances lie uh, in that particular process. It was a supply chain and, um, and it was a centralized supply chain. And uh, so they really didn't get centralization. They just got everybody still doing everything their way. Interesting. So a lot of companies in S4 HANA is probably a good example or a good uh, reference point for a type of ERP system that a lot of organizations typically implement because they want a certain amount of standardization and common business processes across the organization. So if I'm a CIO or a project team member involved in a transformation and I'm implementing any ERP system and I say, hey, I've got a single instance of the software. So I, it's not like I've got different variations of the software. It's one instance we're using across the globe and I didn't customize. I'm using commercial off the shelf functionality. I just did some light configuration. What you're saying is it's still possible that even in that environment, you could still have multiple variations of how you use the system. So it's, in other words, it's not going to box in all the users into a certain process flow necessarily. That's that's right. And and you uncovered probably the big problem when it comes to rolling out something like an S4 in the sense that it has the capability to do it. But many times people, well, the SI looks at it as being, a, um, what do you call it? A level three, level four process is what they start with but they never get down to the detail of how people actually do that in the business. And so you might find there's people who are creating um, invoices or having invoices come in before they actually get a purchase order. Uh, mm-hmm. They might have um, go out and don't even get an uh, invoice and just pay it on a credit card. Um, so there's all of those sorts of things that can happen that S4 in a rollout stage doesn't really look at because it doesn't get down to that level. And uh, whereas this allows you to be able to identify all right the way down. So are you using a credit card? Are you getting a purchase rec? Uh, Have you had to change the price? And so that's where that consistency starts to drive back into the process. And that's where you get performance out of your technology platform instead of just this assumed level three process that um, many organizations start with. And, uh, and they don't actually apply to the business context or to the operating model. And I hark back to the operating mm-hmm. model, but it's understanding how we operate as an organization and then what processes, how we conduct those processes. Interesting. Um, so it, I don't know why that question and answer triggered this thought, but it, if I'm a internal auditor and I'm concerned about controls and risk you know, or either just in general or because maybe we're, we need to be sarbanes oxley compliant if we're a U.S.-based public company or we have other regulatory controls we need to have in place depending on where we're based in the world. Um, is this something that could help with that too? Maybe identify where there's control issues or uh, not necessarily an inefficiency or process breakdown or variation, but more of a, a breakdown in the controls and security of the, of the system? Yeah, the early adoption of the tools like Salonis was, was for that, was actually to audit and trace to be able to get um, you know reporting compliance and some auditors who were specialized auditors could identify where there wasn't controls within certain processes. So uh, it's evolved since then and um, process mining's only been around for probably five or six years. So it's not, a, not been around a long time, but it's really evolving very quickly. Hmm. Interesting, okay. Um, so the, the question that um, I wanted to get to uh, here, in addition to some funny comments here, um, what about, um, you, you sort of did this, this is similar to the question I asked you, but maybe you could, we could go into it a little deeper or maybe pick a different example. Uh, but the question here is from Rahendra on LinkedIn. And he says, could you share a process flow example and dashboard generated by the process mining tool? I, I suppose we probably can't show you a dashboard right now on the fly, but could you maybe walk through a, a process flow that you might, you know, that you might analyze and sort of where the process mining tool might collect different pieces along the way? Is that something that's, you could think of a good example we could verbally talk through? Um, yeah, or well, procure to pay is probably a good one because most people understand it and most people buy things in their organization. Um, the, the process 
I suppose that we look at is is aligned to what our process is. So you might find there's certain steps or workflows that we actually have as an organization. When you do the evaluation, you start to see where those various points of the workflows touch. Um, and so you might say there's an approval uh, level where someone's got to approve expenditure. Um, and so you can see the time it takes for that, or you can see if there's processes where you need to change the price um, on what you're purchase ordering after you've already got quotes and you've been through that process. Um, and, or you might find that you get to the end where the material hasn't been supplied, um, yet you've received an invoice or there's not a good receipt in place. Um, and so, so you can pick up all of those areas or those steps that might not follow this standard process. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's that's super helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, have you, this one's from uh, Liam on, on LinkedIn, and his question is, uh, if a user is manually converting a system created by... Uh, I'm sorry, if a user is manually converting system created requisition to an order, could you see if they are doing any value add in that process? Would the process mining suggest to use an automated purchase order conversion function? Yeah, and that's that's one of the interesting things that are evolving out of this is that many times, um, especially even in the goods receipt place, is that if you've got an invoice and it matches what your purchase order is, then you should be able to three-way match and automate that. And the same thing when it comes to uh, purchasing. If you've then got uh, vendor agreements where you've got set pricing schedules, if that pricing schedule comes in and it matches with what your purchase order is, you can automatically create that purchase order. So there's a lot of flexibility when it comes to getting consistency and automation as part of your process when you understand what what the inputs are to actually create that right now what about if i were um if i'm an organization that is thinking about my digital strategy for the next three five ten years or whatever maybe i'm thinking about an erp system or maybe i'm not sure and i just want to evaluate sort of what my current lay of the land is and what my future state might look like in terms of new technologies processes people changes all that good stuff how how can a process mining tool an approach get us started on that journey or, or how could it provide input into that digital strategy and planning journey? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because your organization has processes anyway. It's the way it conducts its business. And so by improving and getting consistency in that space, you have the ability to look at any different technology platform that you might be able to implement because they follow a sort of standard linear process we as organizations like to complicate that and so we'll put um you know different workflows or different approval steps but it allows us to have clarity of that so when we actually go to the solution integrator to actually build our platform we go maybe not from vanilla but we put in those steps but we're not really customizing uh, whereas the problem is if we don't do that and we've got a lot of inconsistent processes we find ourselves at the design stage trying to accommodate all of those inconsistencies and that's where we get a lot of customization of process and hard to close design and all those sort of things. So it's a really good step to get us consistent in our process. And when you look at a lot of um, organizations that are disruptors, the one thing you can point on is that they've perfected their process to be consistent. So companies like Uber and those sort of companies where you know they're dealing with clients and they're processing um, orders and those sort of things it's done consistently no matter where you are across the world and they can monitor that and so that's their power that's their strength um but how they, how they make a difference yeah yeah it seems like you know when you look at organizations clients we work with at third stage a lot of them are struggling with how do we scale you know we've yeah. reached we've grown to a certain point and now we're kind of hitting a ceiling where we can't scale to that next level. And a lot of times it's because of inconsistent or broken processes. And what you're saying, it, it sounds like that this approach or this tool set can help um, identify, you know, where are those scalability issues and where are those variations and the breakdowns that we need to kind of 
uh, create a common operating model so that we can get to that next level. Is that? That's right. And it also allows uh, business units to actually work within an end-to-end process environment. Many times we have, as a business unit, I do it this way, and then you know maybe accounts payable picks it up, and they've got to then deal with whatever happened throughout that my way type thing. Whereas if you actually get it where they are all doing their piece in that puzzle, then you find that you know the value comes, that scalability happens, the automation opportunities come out of it. Right. All right. Good stuff. Thanks, Wayne. We're going to come back with more questions about process mining. As soon as we take a quick break, we'll be back with more Transformation Ground. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling, and I'm here with Wayne Holtham, and we're talking about uh, process mining. So let's jump back into the conversation. And then back to the you know, sort of that digital strategy question I had, or maybe a follow-up there. It, it also sounds like if I'm not sure, you, you know, you talked about going to your system integrator and providing inputs that'll help with the, the actual implementation. But even if we back up earlier than that, if I don't even know if I'm ready for an ERP system or CRM or HCM or any other technology, it seems like this would be an important diagnostic or an important input to help me understand, you know, where exactly are the opportunities for improvement? What are my priorities, you know, as far as what parts of my business are the most broken or ripe for opportunity? Is that true? Or it, could you see that being used? Or have we have we used that with clients on helping define a digital strategy and a path forward? Well, it's interesting because some organizations are told by a vendor, you need to upgrade your technology. Whereas when you actually look at it from the process mining perspective, you actually go, well, if we get our processes right, I wouldn't need to change that. I can actually be very efficient in what I do and put off that decision to a time where I as an organization are ready uh, or I find um, a, you know, a technology that really, really suits me ideally. Whereas um, instead of just going and saying, well, it's time to update, let's put something in. Um, this way you can actually really strategize about where your unique um, uniqueness in, in the way you do your business and then put a technology in that really aligns with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. I think a lot of, a lot of organizations feel like they have to do something now because their vendors are telling them, Hey, we're, you know, we're going to sunset this product in 2025 or, you know, whatever the year is. And, uh, this gives you sort of more, it aren't, it equips you with information and knowledge that is really power in this whole decision-making process where you can make a educated, informed decision on what, what you do or don't do or where your priorities might be and where you, you really do need technology upgrades or improvements versus maybe not. Yeah. And it's inter- interesting over the years, you know, you go in and you do a major deployment, but you're taking out a technology that people say isn't very good. It doesn't work very well. We've got all these pain points. And then you look at what you roll out, you end up with the same pain points as you had before. If you'd fixed what you had before, far less cheaper, and you have to get the same benefit, but uh, no one could see what those pain points were. And I think now there's the opportunity to be able to see that. Yeah, and just going back to your example of the 17 ways of doing a, a process within S4 HANA, you know, if I'm if I if that were true before you implemented a new ERP system, you had 17 different ways of doing things, um, and you didn't fix that, you're just going to put in new technology. And you're probably going to keep doing things 17 different ways, even with a a more advanced system is just going to be more advanced way of doing 17 things. And that's, and that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. And this allows you to be able to put in best of breed. So because you can go across module or cross platform or cross vendor solution, 
you can actually have a CRM from one company and you can have an ERP from another and you can have a mobility device from another and you can link those to whether um, architecturally how they should actually go yeah, to, to work together. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Super, super interesting. And then of course, building your, uh, your business case too, you know, if, if you're thinking about a digital transformation or you're trying to figure out is the ROI there, am I going to get a good cost benefit out of this investment or potential investment in technology? This gives you some really good quantitative real metrics. This isn't just, you know, like a lot of times software vendors will say, Oh, you know, you can save 50% on your inventory and 25% of your GNA costs. If you implement our technology, well, that's, I mean, who knows if that's real or not. It's probably not real to, even if it's a real, a real average, it's probably not real to you as an organization, but this gives you actual real data you can use to build a business case too, I would think. That's exactly right. And, and that's the real benefit because you can say, well, if I'm spending X amount of millions of dollars to put in a platform, I can see that I'm going to get this improvement and I can bank that improvement because I can watch that improvement happen and I can measure that improvement. And so um, that's the powerful thing is that benefits realization in the past was very hard to measure. And uh, whereas today, you can measure it right down to the last dollar. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so another question here from uh, a couple more questions here on LinkedIn. Um, should we expect this is this one is from Rahendra as well. Thank you for all the great uh, questions, Rahendra. These are really good. Um, should we not expect modern ERPs have built in process mining tools, at least at some level? Have you, have you seen that yet? Where ERP systems or any sort of enterprise technology has a process mining tool built in, or are these truly still standalone products for the time being? Well, I think the software vendors are starting to see the need, hence the reason that Signavia was actually bought by SAP. Um, originally, when Solonis started, SAP offered selling Solonis licenses um, for their clients to be able to use the system. So they see the value, but at this stage, it's probably one of those areas that they're not, they see there's a diversion for their um, mm. platform or, or solution. But I think in the future, there's gonna be a lot more of uh, process mining, process evaluation that they will incorporate into their deployment of uh, new solutions. SAP is definitely going that way. And it's probably been their Achilles heel in this S4 world, because um, that's the challenge. People are going, well, I need to actually get my processes right to get the benefits out of S4. And there hasn't really been a good mechanism to be able to do that. And that's the, um, the real problem with a lot of these deployments where they don't get the value in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would think the software vendors are, have bigger fish to fry in the, in the next few years, just trying to convert all their legacy customers over to cloud systems and trying to push as many of them as they can to convert to, to cloud. Um, but, you know, once we get past through this, uh, what I, what I, re, what I think of as sort of version two, 2.0 2 of Y2K, it's like Y2K yeah. all over again. Now everyone's sort of <laughs> rushing to get to the cloud. Now, once we get through that and the, you know, the IT software sales sort of plateau off as a result of that, um, I would imagine this might be an area that would be ripe for, uh, getting the holdouts to, con you know, giving them a good data to help the holdouts convert to cloud or to sell them additional software. So I would think eventually ERP vendors might be well suited to, to have these tools built in. I, I think they will. And um, at the moment, like you say, the vendors are grappling with that change of code from, you know, the old way of on-premise to on-cloud and many are still immature in that space. And so there's a lot of focus in their space to try and get the leverage of the new way that the platform should operate and depart away from the old on-premise view or code that they would have had in the past. Uh, still, there's a, a lot of immaturity in that space, even in the cloud area. And when we actually have SaaS solutions, the function that they have in there is quite limited. Um, and that's, that's a big gap for um, the major players in the um, ERP space, at least. Right, right. Great. Um, oh, this is actually a really good question. This is from uh, from Liam on LinkedIn. Um, and actually, I, I'm glad he asked this because I was trying to think of something along these lines. I was thinking about data privacy, but he actually comes at it from a better angle, uh, which is, um, could you have a worker's revolt on your hands because they, they view process mining as surveillance software? 
So is this sort of a big brother uh, dystopian sort of uh, <laughs> situation that, that could have a negative ramification? Have you seen that at all in order? Well, it's, it's interesting because when you're trying to sell the concept, if you aren't at the right level in the business, that is that's what happens people go well you're going to see what we do and we've been doing it this way for so long we're very protective of that so not necessarily the revolt but resistance for sure when you get in at the level where you know your executive level and they start to see the value and how they can actually drive that value in their business and get consistency and really also asking their people to do is to do the process as it needs to be done not workarounds and those sort of things, then you know it's not really Big Brother telling you what to do. It's just saying, well, here's the process we've defined. We just, if you did it that way, it'd be great for us. Yeah, right. Does does process mining get down to that level of, uh, you know, for example, you know, in the, the example you gave with the seventeen different processes. If I'm if I'm individually doing something one in one of those seventeen different variations, is it get down to that level of granularity to see that Eric Kimberling is the problem? He's he's off doing his own thing over here, or he's taking too long to go through this process when we compare it to other people, or is it more yeah. of a collective uh, look? Down to the who processed it, um, when you processed it, maybe how long you took to process it, whether you didn't process um, process it. So it's um, yeah, it's got a lot of detail. Yeah, interesting. So to Liam's question or point, I mean, if if you're at that level down lower in the organizations and you are a decision maker or have any input into this tool, you might say, well, let's not do that. That's not not the kind of ability we necessarily want to need. But at the senior levels in the organization, you're probably going to want to see what, you know, what's happening in reality in those different parts of the. And it's a great tool because when you think you bring new people into the organization, no one ever gets onboarded completely about how you should do a process. So they adopt maybe what they did the last organization. So this allows you to be able to look at it at that detail and then find training ways to be able to uh, upskill that person to get the consistency. So many see it as a benefit for onboarding and maintaining consistency across the organization. So there is a plot positive to it. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Have you seen it used to the point yet where I might use data from the process mining tool to evaluate you as a as an employee to to evaluate you individually and your productivity and to give you coaching and to, have you seen it at that level yet or is it more from the analysis of just trying to figure out how do we fix processes in general and have you have definitely you seen from it? the coaching level because um, especially when you roll out a major deployment and you want to be able to see if people are actually adopting. Uh, the platform or the processes, it allows you to be able to go back to those people and say, well, you know, we're noticing that this isn't being done the way we envisaged. You're doing it this way. Let us train you or let us coach you the better way. The other thing that uh, really advanced processing, process mining allows you to do, it will flag up, here's what you should do. So you can have business rules built into the process so it will alert the user to say that um, in this case you should be maybe offering this or processing this or you know doing these sorts of things which allow the organization to get the maximum benefit so it might be bonuses you know when you actually if you pay early you get a bonus it alerts you or the user to actually go ahead and make those uh, payments so that the company can retrieve those bonuses. So that's a, you know, an example. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that that use case before, or or that intent, or that purpose of uh, for using the tool. Um, so just as a last question here, as we come up at the the top of the hour here, it, what what is the best place to start, or where how how does someone get started on a process mining initiative? I mean, what what do you what would you recommend to someone who's thinking about? Are intrigued by this whole concept of process mining? I think one of the ways that I got uh, involved in the early days when I was working in functional role was um, I saw on YouTube a clip and uh, I looked at what process mining was and uh, and then started to talk about, you know, to my leaders, um, this would be a good opportunity and, uh, and start from that basis. Uh, it was one of those things, knowledge is power 
and uh, and you shouldn't be frightened of process mining. There's a lot more benefits to it than there is being frightened of it. Yeah, yeah, it's super cool. I mean, it's 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 just a it's a different um, it's a different tool, and, and it addresses a need that's been there for so long. I think back to one of the very first comments you made at the very beginning of this discussion was that you know instead of sitting in a conference room and talking about processes, you can now look at the data. You can still talk about the processes, but at least now you have data to support those discussions and to be able to guide and help you focus on maybe where you want to hone in and drill down and understand a little bit better. Um, and it's fascinating that in some ways it's fascinating that it's taken this long to have a tool like this uh, out there. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the growth of um, companies like Solonis has just been exponential growth. You know, they, they call them a unicorn. So there's very few companies that, that grow as fast as from nothing. So, you know, process mining was not anything before, whereas um, in a very short time, it's, it's now a really um, strong methodology uh, that people are seeing the benefits for. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Great stuff. Thanks a lot, Wayne. Thanks for being on the show and uh, helping us understand and unpack a little bit more about process mining and how it fits into digital transformation. And uh, you've triggered a lot of thoughts and questions and follow-up items that we're going to discuss. Uh, Kyler and I are going to discuss that here in a second. But first, we'll take a quick break, and we'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham, and you can find new episodes every Wednesday on YouTube and all the usual podcast platforms. Be sure to subscribe to us, uh, comment if you've got comments, give us a review. We'd love any sort of feedback you might have on this episode or the show in general. Uh, so we appreciate your your feedback as always. So uh, Kyler, we just had Wayne on the show, Wayne Holtham from our team in Australia, and he was talking about process mining. Uh, what were your thoughts? Is, is process mining a term that you were familiar with prior to this conversation or that you knew much about or what were your general observations? only because I edit all Wayne's content is why, why I knew that term. Um, but I was so excited to hear him kind of explain it. Again, a great guest that's able to kind of uncomplicate or unpack a really, um, you know, a, a really technical subject. So um, I did have a question. I loved all the audience questions too. I learned a ton from them. Um, but what, does um, the data or the data mining, the business process mining, does that have to happen within a digital transformation or is that just an exercise independent in itself? It, it really is an exercise independent in and of itself. I mean, we, we're, we're actually doing it for a few clients right now uh, as part of a sort of a prerequisite or a, a first phase of a, of a digital transformation. And it helps with that current state assessment and really setting some metrics behind how your processes are today versus what you want them to be or what you thought they were. And so uh, it certainly can enable a more effective digital transformation. But the thing that struck me in the discussion is that you don't need to be going through a big ERP or CRM or HCM supply chain transformation to, to leverage this technology. It, in some cases, your technology might be fine. It might be okay or good enough to get you through a few more years. But process mining is a way to really optimize and get more value out of the technology and processes and people that you have in place right now. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a great point, especially for some of maybe our smaller to medium-sized businesses and when this is an exercise that they, they can go through. Um, because I assume it's a great process for someone that's in a high growth phase. Um, would you agree? Yeah, yeah, someone that's uh, growing quickly or uh, and or someone that's gone out and, and acquired 
a bunch of other organizations or you've grown organically and now you've opened new locations or new business units, new markets or whatever. And so process mining can be a way to really uncover and identify all the variations and breakdowns in the process along the way, which a lot of organizations sort of intuitively know that there's some breakdowns or we're not as efficient as we could be, or we've got too many variations in our in our business processes and workflows, but this sort of validates it and helps point you exactly to where the biggest problems are and where some of the biggest uh, opportunities for improvement are as well. Certainly. I think that that validation is is key to be able to leverage an opportunity like this. So I, I wonder when you actually uncover those efficiencies, or I, I thought it was really interesting, the fact that you could not only track the business process, but you could track the lags in the process. Um, so see where someone might turn to a tactic that's more of that tribal knowledge, right, that we kind of talk to Brad about, whether it's a spreadsheet or they just know how to do it in their head, that type of stuff. So it seems to me that this could cause a lot of resistance on the organizational change side. Um, just the fact that you're kind of saying, oh, the computer's saying, you know, you're doing your process inefficiently. I can't imagine that that's easy news to deliver. Is that something that's a huge consideration in kind of resi- re- delivering results for these types of projects or clients? It It is real in terms of the perception. I mean, that's a very real concern that team members of organizations have in that they feel like, you know, big, big brothers watching or we're under surveillance. Um, and it's understandable. I mean, I, I get why people might think that, but the reality is, is it's not as if, or as though someone is, uh, necessarily using the tool to look at, you know, you or me individually, it's looking at the processes in general to see where the breakdowns are. At least that's the way it should be used. Um, now, having said that, I'm sure out there somewhere are people using process mining for other, you know, maybe uh, nefarious reasons or things that are really truly big brother watching individuals, but that's not the intent of the software. The intent is to is to really hone in on where the process breakdowns are, the inefficiencies, and not so much look at well, whose fault is that? But look at what's happening in the system, you know, and it's usually looking at trends and patterns. It's not, it's not meant to point out one person out of a group of a hundred that's doing something wrong. It's meant to point out a hundred people that are doing the same thing inefficiently, or there's something in the system that's breaking down and really using that as a, as a way to point the uh, analysis focus on, okay, let's figure out why those hundred people are having that breakdown. Let's do some root cause analysis and figure that out. So, you know, as long as people are using it for for those types of purposes, it shouldn't be perceived that way, but it probably will be to some degree, especially if you don't uh, get ahead of that that perception with, with uh and I think one of the one of the questions I asked too um with Wayne was, you know, can uh and I think I asked it in the interview. I know I asked him at, at one point, I'm not sure if it was live on the interview or not, but um I asked him whether or not um it it could be used for those purposes or if, if, you know, he's seen it used for those purposes and he said, yes, it, it can be, but that's not, you know, he sort of said the same thing. It's not the intent of it. That definitely makes a, a lot of sense. So is, is that um, sort of an expectation or um, a transparency that we set up front with organizations saying, you know, this is the goal of this and the strategies are to really identify where our processes can be enhanced to help your job. Is that kind of how that's positioned? Yes, um, that is part of it, um, and that that assumes that there's a a broad understanding that th- that this process mining activity is happening. Um, I usually wouldn't suggest that you don't publicize something, but in this case, and, and another question I asked Wayne in the interview was, do people know that it's happening? I mean, if I didn't, if you didn't tell me, would I know that there's process mining happening that's kind of tracking the processes in my system and everything? Um, and he said, no, you know, it doesn't, you don't necessarily know it. So I guess the question then, and, and this is really going to come down to your organizational culture and, you know, I could make an argument on either side of this, but, um, you, know, you may want to think about, do, do we need to communicate this or do we just take the raw data we get the consolidated raw data and say, okay, based on our analysis, here are some process breakdowns and workflow breakdowns that we'd like to uncover, unpack a little bit more, and let's figure out how to address those, um, you know, that's, that's one answer. The other answer would be to be a lot more transparent and come out and, you know, announce that this is happening, but then you've, you have to be ready for the fact you're probably going to get quite a bit of blowback. 
as an organization. And you probably, and, and you also have to think about the risk reward of that too. Is it, is it worth me communicating, you know, over communicating something that I don't necessarily need to, am I going to get more pushback and more resistance, uh, and create more heartburn for myself by announcing that? Or is my culture the type where, you know, it, it might be better to just, you know, get the data, uh, consolidated data and, and, and analyze it from there. Uh, I think that's, that's more of a case by case basis. You have to make that decision though. Yeah. Sure. I could definitely see both sides of that, um, you know, in, in kind of consuming the results as a leadership team, and then maybe you're able to address it with one vertical within the business or one area in which you, you see opportunity as opposed to causing, you know, a lot of disruption in your overall culture. Right. Um, that's, that's a, you know, a definitely something that we always preach is kind of by your needs basis. And it seems like that's something that you would kind of develop within that strategic piece. I'm curious, how many times do these types of exercises like business process mining convert into a digital transformation? Um, if you had to say like half of them typically say, oh, we need a new um, software system or we need a new type of uh, platform to handle all of this, how, how many times does that actually kind of seem like the natural progression? That's a hard one to answer because, uh, you know, our sample size okay. is is biased. I mean, it's inherently skewed towards companies that are going through digital transformation and therefore they hire us and therefore we use process mining to help analyze the best path forward in the context of a digital transformation. But I, I see just as much opportunity out there for organizations that maybe either aren't sure if they need to go through a digital transformation or they, they're uncertain as to what the scope of the transformation should be if they do go through one because they don't know where the biggest value is going to come from. This is a good way to give you some quantitative data to, to give you those answers. Um, and then there's other organizations that just flat out are not in a position to go through a digital transformation, either because they don't have the, the capital and operating budget or they just don't have the, the patience or the tolerance or the bandwidth. Or you know maybe their technology is fine and they've got other issues or other fish to fry. So I think the opportunities are probably more companies out there, honestly, that could benefit from this that aren't doing it as part of a transformation. But, you know, an overwhelming majority, if not all of the the situations we see from our clients are in the context of digital transformation, at least so far. Um, I'm sure that'll change over time. Right. Definitely. And it's it sounds like this is a great kind of first step if you are on kind of the brink of considering going through a, a digital transformation is we, ju- we talk a lot about the data cleansing step. I know in our threes video, that was a main tactic for people that are considering any type of transformation or implementation. And it sounds like this option with these two software systems um, are a great way to kind of take that data and say, oh, okay, maybe we just need some behavior changes or some process changes within our community or maybe we do need a whole new system to be able to work um, that change. Uh, and so I, I think it's it's a great opportunity and I, I'd love Wayne to kind of come back and take us through how his client case study is going and kind of what their findings were on that side because I, I bet it's pretty revealing in utilizing that data. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know when, you know, it reminds me of a project I had about 20 years ago, it was early 2000s. I, it was the first project I had actually led, you know, as the lead consultant on, and uh, it was for the uh, a big power company in Southern Africa, and uh, they had just implemented SAP you know, ERP system, and they had also just implemented a geographic information system, which is very common in the utility space. It's it's a, a software that tracks all of your assets out in the field, like substations and power lines and power anything to do with delivering the power. And uh, they had just implemented all this technology and they were, they, it was a mess. You know, they, they were ha- having trouble figuring out why the data was flawed and why they couldn't get, you know, the processes to work. And so we manually went in and analyzed their end-to-end processes and found all the breakdowns and sort of dove in and get to the root cause of it. And so what this does is that automates that process to where you don't need to manually do it. You've got a tool now that can give you actual data with a big sample of day-to-day process flows that'll, that'll help, um, uh, um, uh, help ensure that. And it also, you know, it allows you to really spend more of your time focusing on the root cause, you know, because you, you're focusing in the right places. You're not analyzing things that aren't the problem or the biggest problems you can now go in and analyze those root causes. So back to your other question too, about, 
could this be used for companies not going through a digital transformation? It, it's definitely a post-implementation benefits realization or optimization tool as well, or that, that is a potential use case for it. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even think of being able to use it after the fact. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that that's, uh, I, and I agree with you, by the way, having Wayne back on to maybe walk through a use case in more detail, I think that'd be pretty cool. But hopefully in the meantime, that gets our wheels cranking and turning about how how we might use process mining within our, our own organizations. So good stuff. Um, so we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back for our, our third segment of the show, we're going to have Teresa Richardson, who's going to be on the show to talk about the ROI of change management and the business value behind it. So we're going to take a quick break and we will have her on the show here in just a moment. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Back to Transformation Ground Control. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. New episodes every Wednesday on YouTube and all the usual podcast platforms. And of course, this show covers everything you need to know about digital transformation every week. So be sure to check us out, subscribe, and check us out every Wednesday. Uh, our next guest I'm excited for uh, is Teresa Richardson from the Third Stage team. She's based out of the United States. We had Wayne on earlier from Asia Pacific, and now we, we've got someone from North America that will be joining the show to talk about the ROI and business value of change management. And this really sort of connects the dots or brings us full circle from the technology and process stuff we were talking about earlier in the show with Wayne to now talking more about the process and people side of the equation. So it helps us complete that whole people process technology trifecta that is so important to any digital transformation. And uh, for this uh, segment, we have uh, Sarah uh, Dokovich, who's on, on our sister podcast called Digital Stratosphere. Um, she actually is sitting down with Teresa to talk about some of this stuff. So why don't I hand it off to you, Sarah, and we'll we'll take it from there. Well, hey, Teresa. Thank you so much for being with us again on the show. Really excited to have you. Thank you. I appreciate being here. Super excited. Girl power, right? Yeah, girl yeah. power, as we were saying before. Awesome. Well, let's dive in. So since one of your areas of expertise is OCM, I'd love to hear your perspective on why change management is so important when it comes to implementing a new software. So I think there's a, a several pieces um, that change management really helps with. So when you look to see who is involved in the process, um, obviously, I, I know I've stated this before, but unless your process is 99.9% .9 automated, people are involved and you really need to get that perspective of how this implementation is going to impact the, the work that's being done to make sure that people understand it, they're trained properly, they have the right tools, they have the right understanding to move that impl implementation along to actually having its, um, the usage rates and the adoption rates up because we have your team, which is, the people in the job creating something that translates to a customer who are people as well uh, for your product. So it's really important to get them on board so they can understand and move with the change. Absolutely. And at that high level, what would you advise organizations that want to quantify their change initiatives? So there's really three. Um, there's the first is the, BPI, which is the business uh, process improvement piece. Um, and that's really looking at your process to, you know, identify inefficiencies, you know, we're going to reduce your waste to improve the workflow with the ERP um, 
integrated into it. You want to make sure that you empower your teams using OCM because it all fits together. Um, you also want to make sure that you have the high rate of velocity of impact, making sure that you're more cost effective and efficient in these changes. Again, you're going to reduce waste from your process and you're going to help become more efficient at what we're doing. Uh, the last thing you want to do is impact your cost of quality with these changes. If you're not um, planning it properly and making sure you're getting all of these elements, the cost of quality or the cost of poor quality could be absolutely huge. You know, looking at that, you want to make sure you reduce your costs, you have an improved customer satisfaction, and that you have that competitive advantage that you need to not only retain, but increase your market share in what you're doing, um, as well as to minimize disruption. That's imperative because we already have a system that may or may not work well for the teams and then you're going to introduce a new system so the risk of further uh, impacting that disruption is huge so you have to make sure that you're managing it right and again I think the worst one for me is the cost of the poor quality for that because you have a perception of uh, customer customer quality or customer satisfaction. Um, you know, my, I said this before, my grandfather hated Ford. I don't know why he hated Ford, but he hated Ford. So I grew up not wanting to buy a Ford. So mm -hmm. the cost of that perception, it, it could be generational. Um, so you really don't have a lot of opportunity to um, manage that. And if you don't manage it well, it could be huge, as well as to remove your non-valued added, added activities in your work. Yeah, so much there for this awesome, awesome advice. <laughs> but um, I would also really love to unpack the elements that you just listed that go into ROI and OCM. So you mentioned um, minimizing operational distribution and how that is a big factor in your return on investment. So is that at the top of the list or is there something bigger? Well, I'm glad you asked because I always use a triangle to measure um, what we're doing and how we're doing it. So traditionally when you do an ERP, people focus on, I'm well, showing me a little triangle here. People focus on the technology, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where third stage comes in and that's where we say, okay, let's evaluate your systems. Let's help you go through uh, the selection and implementation, et cetera. But there's actually more pieces to this that you really need to consider. At the top is your people, and that's really your OCM, right? So now you have your tech and now you have your people, but you also need to consider your processes. So this is your business process improvement. And honestly, having all three of these will strengthen your ROI. So this is where your money goes. This is where the money is right here. If one of these are off, you could impact a piece of your return, which means you won't get everything you're ex expecting to get. So all of these really need to kind of come together to have a good solid uh, ROI for, for your project. Yeah, definitely. I love how you explain that so nicely in the, the pyramid. So, so just anybody who's watching visually, uh, they can kind of see that too. I'm hoping this, this translates well, by the way. Yeah, no, absolutely. We can, okay. we can see it. And if there's any more questions, I'm sure they can contact Reach out to third stage. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And it sounds like this is like a big step to your return on investment. So do you have anything else to add regarding how companies should prepare their organization so that they can receive the biggest return? I would say, again, making sure that your OCM and your processes in conjunction with the uh, the technology really aligns. Um, if you have a great system, but nobody uses it, what's the use of the great system, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a great system and you have your people bought in, but your processes are now completely off kilter because you didn't look at your as is and to be and understand the transition, you just lost an opportunity. So the one thing that you don't want to do is waste time, waste resources, um, and create a condition where you might not be able to uh, recover from. So another big um, cost is having to 
when, when, if employees leave, the cost of having to hire, search, hire, and train new people. So that's a huge cost as well. That's wrapped up in your people, as well as the cost of losing customer confidence or customer satisfaction. How much money do you really have to wrap into getting those customers back and creating those relationships again? So those are those hidden unintentional impacts to the implementation of a system where you don't take these other things into consideration. So those hidden impacts could even have a bigger um, result on your ROI. Yeah, there, there's so much to look at here, so much to kind of really assess from that, you know, the, the I guess the bird's eye view of everything to just to yeah. that's like where you're at currently so you know where to go next as well. Absolutely. And, yeah, no, definitely. So I know that there's a lot in this conversation. So we're going to take a quick break. And so when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about this topic. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. I'm Sarah Dugovich speaking with Teresa Richardson from Third Stage Consulting. So let's get back to it. Now, before the break, you were talking about the key factors when talking about ROI and organizational change management. So now, if you think about it, change is all about perception and influence is birthed from perceived value. So how can you communicate to leadership that investing in OCM initiatives will impact the ROI? Um, so... My perspective is this, and, I, and I've been in corporate for a very long time, uh, over 20 years in, in the corporate space. Now I'm in, in, in the, a different space. But one thing that I know that a lot of leaders have focused on are the nuts and bolts of things, right? So at the end of the day, people are our foundation. You'll either have team members who are creating or delivering. And on the other side, you have people that are receiving or your customers. So you have to make sure that you understand people are the foundation and taking them into consideration when you have, you know, your process changes. Okay. How do they impact people? Or you have your technology uh, upgrades or implementations. How does it impact people and how does it impact your technology? And then if your people don't use your technology or they're not involved in the process and it's not working for them, your entire triangle is off. It's just off. So if you want a strong ROI, you have to consider all pieces of your project to make sure that every lens is covered. Um, and that's where third stage really excels because we do understand and we look at all of these factors from different lenses to make sure that we're understanding what those potential areas of improvements or opportunities are. Yeah, definitely. It's more like that 360, like almost like a holistic view rather than like just the specialist focusing on that one pinpointed area. So yeah. absolutely. You you want to make sure and I and I get the business perspective. I completely understand at the end of the day, your dollars are your bottom line. But if we don't take these other impacts that could create hidden uh, risks, your bottom line will not be where you need it to be. Yeah, totally. Now I wanted to kind of touch on <laughs> the dark side, if you will, of transformation failure. So how significant is change management's influence on project success? Would you say? Well, I will uh, reference um, a project that I was involved in uh, prior to. Um, it had to do with uh, freight costs. Um, 
And the company did not look at the people side of it, right? They were looking at the dollar side of it and they were looking at the technology side of it. And what had happened was they didn't really ask and understand um, the different aspects from those other two. And it increased their freight costs for three executive, three executive consecutive, excuse me, three consecutive quarters um, tremendously. And then they brought in process improvement. By that time though, they were, they were very much over their budget and for them to recoup was almost impossible. So then they had to carry that over to the next year. So again, you know, when you're looking at things from a certain lens and you're not taking the other ones into consideration, you're missing these potential impacts to your process, to your relationships with customers, which translates to an impact to your bottom line. So instead of you meeting goal and meeting your targets, now you're exceeding them and now you're in the red. And now you have to look to other pieces of the business to see how you can redistribute those funds or redistribute those costs to make sure that there's balance in your annual budget. And it, it was just a mess, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's a bit disappointing. And I guess now we know that definitely change strategies are a must and I have an order to be successful. So um, I wanted, yeah, I wanted to kind of pivot now to more of like um, the OCM side of things. Um, should this be an internal or a third party thing, would you say? So uh, my opinion is that an OCM strategy has to be owned by an organization. Um, but bringing in a consultant or a third party would be helpful for that unbiased um, look into what you're doing and how you're doing it, right? So as a consultant, you come in with, I want to help you, let's figure it out. You don't have any preconceived issues or preconceived ideas or maybe some established relationships. You just come in with really, okay, I have a, a whiteboard in front of me, let's figure it out. Um, but at the end of the day, when I leave or somebody else leaves, we need to make sure we did our job so you are comfortable with change and you carry it forward with other aspects of what you're doing in your business. Mm -hmm. And what would you say about software vendors and system integrators? Do they help manage change too? I absolutely believe that. Um, I look at everything as a team or as collaborative, right? You can't run a business in a silo. I've seen too many that have, and they suffered greatly and had huge impacts, not just from cost, but quality relationships, customer satisfaction, employee turnover, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I, if, in my opinion, um, everybody is their own SME and you have to come together in a collaborative spirit at the same table to discuss what we need to do and how we can move forward. So if I were working in a silo and, you know, keeping system integrators over there and, you know, keeping OCM there and keeping vendors here, we're each looking at it through our own lens and we're not understanding how could, how it's supposed to all flow together. But until we become that collaborative team, we won't get that information. So they absolutely need to work. We absolutely need to work together to give the client what, they're expecting from us. So yes. Yeah. I love that. Definitely. I'm, I'm with you on that whole collaborative kind of effort. So that way, like, you know, like you were just saying, everybody's on board, they can share the, the, the vision, if you will, together rather than like just saying what they see. Like, Absolutely. I don't know how many times I've been at the table where, you know, we're discussing what we're doing and it impacts how it impacts the system. And then someone says, oh my gosh, I had no idea that what I'm doing is causing that defect or causing that issue for you. So, okay, let's work together to fix it and make sure that doesn't happen so we can have a smoother, higher quality product or process or whatever. Yeah, definitely. And there's just been so much in this conversation. So I'm super grateful that you were able to peel back those layers for us. But um, 
if our listeners uh, want to learn more about organizational change management or ROI or transformations in general, what are some resources that you might suggest for them? So um, I know we have a great resource, the third stage OCM report um, that we can provide if anyone wants to reach out, um, but also doing a lot of the, the background research um, for OCM and what it entails and how to do it. And it's funny because when I have discussions on change management, businesses think that is like a policy or procedure committee that we need to take things through, but that's, that's not what it is. So really educating yourself on what it is and how it can help is, is very beneficial as well. Amazing. Awesome. Well, we're about out of time for today's episode, but I do want to thank you so much for your time, Teresa. You're welcome. Glad to do it. All right. Thanks a lot, Sarah and Teresa. That is really good stuff. Uh, A subject that's near and dear to my heart. I love talking about change management. In fact, I love talking about it so much that we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and talk about some additional points or build on some of the thoughts that Sarah and Teresa had. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. We just had a great guest on, uh, Teresa Richardson from the Third Stage team, talking about the business value and ROI of change management. What were some of your thoughts Kyler, from, from that whole discussion. Yeah, I always love when we we marry change management with actual metrics and explain to our audience how truly not having an investment in or a strategy behind change management can truly affect your bottom line or the overall excess of not only your project, but also your business. Um, so Teresa always makes such a great point that unless you're a 100% automated company, there is always going to be a people component. Even when we're talking about the business process mining or any sort of technology, there's always a people component. So I wondered if we might dig into a little more of operational disruption that she had mentioned when it comes to if you didn't have a change plan, you're at a very high risk for experiencing some operational disruption and that might influence your ROI. So I wondered if you could give us a more specific example, Eric, of of what type of operational disruption you've seen with a client that didn't invest in change or um, that you've experienced throughout your career. Yeah, I I could give you dozens or hundreds of examples probably, but maybe one that comes to mind immediately just because we were talking about it earlier in this episode related to supply chain shortages and, uh, you know, that one one out of a hundred raw materials that you're missing. And because you're missing that one material, you can't finish the, the order or finish the production run, which affects your revenue. Um, so if you use that as an example, let's just say I'm a, um, I'm a purchasing clerk of sorts and I am responsible for purchasing the raw materials that, that I need to uh, produce whatever my product or service is. And if for some reason I am not trained in the fact that I've got this new system now that will uh, anticipate or flag potential shortages or flag when inventory levels are getting low on a certain material or potentially flag a potential breakdown in the supply chain. If I'm not trained on that and I don't know how to use the technology and the tools to do that, I'm going to overlook that and I'm not going to see that there is a potential problem that technology is trying to warn me about, but I'm not seeing it. I'm not able to access it or whatever, for whatever reason. Maybe I wasn't trained appropriately. Maybe the system isn't configured the right way. There could be a number of reasons why that happens, but look at that one person and the impact that one person and not 
having the right change management in place um, can have can have on the overall uh, process. So I, I fail to place that order for the raw material and suddenly I'm responsible or I'm the, the cause of that one piece of the 100 piece puzzle that's missing that we were talking about before. And now I can't ship product to the customer, customer cancels order, you know, multiply that by however many customers were dependent on that same raw material in, in leading into the finished goods. And you can see how that sort of trickles, uh, matriculates throughout the entire uh, supply chain. And then you multiply that one mistake times however many hundreds or thousands of mistakes might be, that might be being had every day uh, in an organization as a result of poor change management. And suddenly, you know, you can be talking massive amounts of money that you're losing because you aren't investing in change management. So that's that's just a real, I guess, a, a simple basic example of where that, that process breakdown or where that lack of change management can really undermine an organization. Right. And then you, you kind of touched on the, the training side, which makes a lot of sense. Um, obviously, if you can't logistically operate the new software or understand how it works, there could be a huge breakage in the customer experience. I wondered if you could talk to us a, a little bit about how um, employee resistance or a, a culture of fear, kind of as Teresa mentioned, might also affect your overall ROI through some sort of operational disruption as well. Can you give us an example of kind of on that culture side of the piece? Yeah. Um, yes. It, so the yeah, culture of fear can can create sort of a, a paralysis where you're afraid to you're afraid to ask questions, you're afraid to think outside the box, or you sort of look outside of what you've been doing every day. So it, it creates this sort of uh, stagnant uh, status quo and comfort with the status quo because I've, I've been taught over time through my culture that if I step outside of that or if I challenge the status quo, you know, there's some negative repercussions that come from that. So that that's a very real um, issue, that, that whole culture thing. And, and just tying it back to the previous example too, uh, you know, it could be that, you know, if my if my job has changed, you, you mentioned training, by the way. So, and that, that's what triggered this thought. If, if, I, if, uh, if I just depend on training to teach me how a new job is going to look, that's not going to be enough because all I'm being taught in training typically is how to use a system. But if my entire job has changed to where uh, I'm not suddenly, if I'm the purchasing clerk, maybe now it's my responsibility to ensure that I'm flagging and remediating raw material, low inventory. Whereas in the past, maybe the shop floor supervisor or the demand planner would be the one to tell me, hey, we're short on this this raw material, so go order it. Um, and not that that's fear-based, but it's you know sort of that command and control culture where I'm just sort of the order taker. I do what people tell me. But now you've given me new technology that is enabling me to do it. And the expectation is really that I should be able to do that because now it's, it's sort of forcing a change to our process and our culture. Um, that's not just going to happen because I put you – you know, I went through some end user training for a couple hours on how to use the system. That's something that needs to be communicated to me clearly and defined and my roles and responsibilities need to change. My metrics need to change. And there's another piece right there that's usually missing from change management when we don't do it right. So back to your fear question though, you know, if I'm operating, you know, in a sense of fear and I'm, I'm afraid to mess up, um, that's actually going to hurt an organization oftentimes because you're not going to you know, you're not going to speak up when there's a problem or, you know, you're not going to think outside the box, you know, to, to find problems like that. Right. Yeah. That's, that's all such great advice, or at least, you know, to be aware of, of what that looks like as far as the experience of the people side of your business within a digital transformation. So we, we talked a little bit about operational disruption and its influence on all over ROI. I wondered if you could talk about implementation costs a lot. I know the. it seems as though when um, there is, there's a kind of a squeeze on the budget that change management can often fall off and kind of ironically or counterintuitively, right, that actually leads to a higher implementation cost, it sounds like, um, in the in the long run because there, there wasn't an investment on that change side. Can you kind of explain to us of why that might be? Yeah. Yeah. So, a way to break this down would be to think about three different buckets of implementation time and cost. You have your uh, your theoretical on paper sort of implementation time and cost. You have your actual implementation time and cost, and then you have your post implementation time, cost, and impact to the business. 
And most organizations only focus on that one, the first one, which is the theoretical, hypothetical, you know, in theory, we should be able to implement in 12 months for a million dollars or, you know, 24 months for $10 million, whatever the number is. Um, but so often that number was never real to begin with, first of all. And so often the only way you're possibly going to achieve that number anywhere close to that number oftentimes is if you invest in change management. And so in, on paper, it looks like, well, wow, I, I don't want to increase my budget by 10 or 15 or 20% or whatever, you know, whatever uh, change management is going to cost me, which I would argue should be at least 10 to 15% of your total budget. On paper, yes, it looks like, well, I could save 10 or 15% if I just don't invest in change management. Okay. Yeah. On paper, but that brings us to the second bucket, which is what really happens is most companies blow that estimate out of the water and they go way over budget. They spend way much, way more time than they, they should. And a big part of that is because they didn't invest in change management. So it's hard to do because you don't have those numbers on paper like you do with the, the estimates. You know, the estimate you get in your sales proposal from your software vendor looks so good and I'm comfortable with that. I don't have anything over here in the second bucket to give me, you know, I don't know what to hang my hat on as far as what it's really going to be. So I'm just going to assume that what they told me is going to be reality. And that's where a lot of times we come in with clients early in the process is to help them rationalize and sort of add a dose of reality to that, those estimates so that they have a realistic budget and timeline. So you have to understand the difference between those two buckets. And then the third bucket is what happens after implementation. So let's just say you did a good job of keeping your, your implementation time and cost where you wanted it to be, but you cut some corners along the way, you didn't invest in change management or whatever. You were still fortunately able to implement relatively close to your time and budget, but now you've created a problem. You just kicked the can down the road to where now when we go live, it's a complete disaster and I can't ship product and I can't you know, satisfy customers, customers are canceling orders, customers are unhappy, I'm ruining my brand, my reputation. And uh, that's the much, much bigger cost that companies rarely think about. You know, they're thinking not about definitely the first bucket, sometimes the second bucket, hardly ever are they thinking about what happens after implementation. And the ones that don't think about that and the ones that cut too many corners early on in the name of implementing on time and on budget, they end up paying so much more money uh, later on than if they just would have loosened their purse strings and invested in the right things in the first two buckets. Um, so I don't know, does that answer your question? That's sort of how that's the dynamic we see, the the strange organizational dynamic we see with, with organizations uh, very often. Yeah. And it sounds like what you're based on what you're saying in your feedback is that um, organizational change management or lack thereof can really have a big financial impact on your overall implementation budget. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I, so it's sort of like, uh, you have to look at both sides again. On one hand, yes, it is going to increase right. your budget. You're going to, you should be increasing your budget. Then, you know, if a vendor tells you it's going to be a million dollars, but they haven't really included much change management, if any, then you might say, okay, you're telling me it's a million. So let me assume it's going to be more like 1.1 or 1.2 million because I'm going to factor in change management, some other things that, you know, aren't covered in that plan. So on one hand, you think, yes, I've, I've increased my costs, but what I'm doing is I'm mitigating risk. That's going to save me a lot more time and money on the flip side after I go live. So yes, the, the, but the way you said it was all, a lot simpler and a lot more clear than the way I described it. No. Great, great details here. Really important considerations. And, and you touched on it a little bit, but I'm wondering about the long-term value um, and kind of measuring the efficiencies behind the business. I know um, both Wayne and Teresa talked about, you know, the implementation and, and how that can create to more um, effective overall business operations. Is that something that is also considered and measured when it comes to change management. Um, so it, we kind of had touched on three things and I'm wondering like long-term, can you measure the effectiveness of change management and overall revenue um, from that lens too? As far as attributing a certain amount of optimization to the change management? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wish. I mean, that's, that's where AI and uh, big data have not yeah. quite caught up yet in terms of giving us actual data that we can, you know, assign numbers to, uh, you know, the value of change management. But, you know, those of us that have done it enough, particularly, you know, not only have I done a lot of change management, but I've, we've done a lot of uh, expert witness cases where there's a lawsuit and we get hired by attorneys to, to analyze the case. In other cases, we have clients who have already failed in their implementation or they're failing 
and they hire us to come in and clean up those projects to get it back on track. So those data points are not quantitative per se, but we've done it so many times that it, it almost always comes back to change management. I mean, it's because you didn't manage the change, right? It's not because you picked the wrong technology or you didn't, you know, you didn't move to the cloud fast enough and that, there, that was your problem. That's, it's usually not that stuff. Usually it's because you didn't address change management. So qualitatively, we know it. We know there's, I know, I'm 100% certain that there's a ton more value coming out of change management than the dollars and time that go into it. But as far as, is it 10x, is it 20x, is it 5x for every dollar you spend? I, that I couldn't tell you, but it, but it's definitely multiples of, you know, of whatever time and money you invest in change management. Now, of course, you get diminishing returns. I'm not suggesting a $1 million project should become a $2 million project all in the name of change management. That probably may not deliver the value you're looking for. But if you're talking about a 10% or a 15% incremental add to your budget to address effectively the organizational change piece, I, I'm very certain that most organizations, if not all, will get multiple times that return on the other side. Right. And I could see an argument for some less intuitive executives that might say, okay, that's great. Yeah. What a, what a nice to have for change management, but it doesn't really belong in our overall budget. So if you are kind of in that project team lead and you have all this great information, knowing that your transformation likely will fail if you don't have change management as a, a main tactic or a main strategy, how do you create a, a business case or some sort of proposal for your executives to kind of turn their head to let them know that, hey, you know, this is a, a true factor. It's not just kind of a, a touchy feely kumbaya um, hand holding type of strategy. It's it's going to affect our our ROI as a business. How how would you go about doing that? Well, I think if you can quantify some what if scenarios that that show you know, what if we didn't invest anything in change management and we had a, uh, you know, over the course of six months after go live, we have uh, 5% of our customers uh, canceled their orders. What, what's that impact? What, what would that look like? And that's, you know, some a metric like that is fairly conservative and that's fairly realistic that if you don't address change management, there's a high likelihood that you're going to screw up orders. You're going to delay them. You're going to get uh, customer cancellations. So what, what is that number? You know, if that number is, you know, if you're talking about a million dollar, ERP implementation, but that number we're talking about over here, that 5% order cancellation results in lost profits of $10 million, then that's a pretty clear business case. Now, it's still an estimate, to be clear. We don't know for a fact that 5% of customers are going to cancel their orders if we don't invest in change management, but that what-if analysis allows us to look at how much do we have to lose? You know, I, I had one client uh, early in my career um, is right. It was just a couple of years after I started our, our, the last consulting company that it, that I had started, and they um, they did exactly that. They they did the opposite of what I just described, where they said, you know, we're not going to spend. It was like an, an extra sixty or seventy thousand dollars to extend the project another thirty days. They decided, no, 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 we we need to cut our losses and just go live. And we had advised delay it thirty days. Yes, it's going to cost you another sixty or seventy k total, but it's going to mitigate a lot of the risk that we were seeing. And they went ahead anyway, and we helped them through that go live, and it was very rocky, and they lost uh, over ten million dollars in lost revenue, canceled orders, which translated to about a million dollars of lost profit. So you compare that sixty thousand dollar additional incremental expense, million dollars of um, lost profit. That's a that's a no brainer. So that's the way you have to think about it. You're never going to be exact. We could never be hundred percent certain that if they just would have invested that sixty k, they would have had zero lost orders, but we know it would have affected in a positive way those, those orders. And that's, you know, so that's the way to think about it is look at the order of magnitude of what numbers you're talking about on either side of the equation. More often than that than not, that's going to get executives comfortable. If you're a super efficient organization and, um, you know, you've got a lot of inventory stockpile and, and uh, you know, you have all these other risk mitigation factors in place, if something were to go wrong, then okay, Maybe it doesn't, the, the case, the business case isn't quite as compelling, but most organizations we work with or see aren't in that position. Right. Well, that's all great information. I think it's, you know, such valuable pieces of um, advice to be able to tell people how important change management is, you know, because it is relative to 
a revenue loss, a dollar amount, as opposed to say you're not an organization that really cares that much about culture or talent loss or things like that. Um, you know, most every organization I would argue would care if they're going to lose money. So I think that's a great conversation and and thanks so much for kind of unpacking that with us. And and thank you to Teresa. I know if any of our audience is interested in speaking with Eric or Teresa about change management, they're both incredibly passionate, um, high energy about that subject. So uh, their contact information goes directly to them. So feel free to reach out to them or or um, drop a comment, and we'll um, we'll get you an answer. That's perfect. Yeah, I'd love to hear any feedback the audience has here. Any uh, additional thoughts related to that? So. Um, good stuff. And this will certainly not be the last time we talk about change management or process mining or any of the other stuff we've talked about. So we'll we'll uh, keep keep going at it in future episodes and unpacking some of the stuff that we've we've started talking about here today and in past episodes. Um, but I want to thank everyone for joining uh, here today. Thank you, Kyler, for being here. And uh, we'll uh, look forward to the the next episode, which comes out every Wednesday on YouTube and all the all the podcast platforms, whatever podcast platform you prefer. You're likely to find us there just search transformation ground control and you'll find us there so uh love any feedback or comments you have give us a review subscribe to the channel all that good stuff subscribe to the podcast make sure you get updates every week when we have new episodes so uh thank everyone for joining today we will see you next time on transformation ground control Mm -hmm.